You want to create pleasantness in your happiness, in your home, we don't know, three, four people are there whether they're going to cooperate or not. If you want to create pleasantness in your city, there are too many people, we don't know whether they'll cooperate or not. If you want to create pleasantness in the world, you know, nobody in this world happens one hundred percent the way you want them. Did your parents happen hundred percent the way you want them? Hmm? Did they? The children can say, it's okay <laughs> Did your friends happen hundred percent the way you want them? Did your spouse or partners happen hundred percent the way you want them? Not even your dog, these days they do their own things <laughs> Nobody happens hundred percent the way you want them, but that is not the problem. The problem is this one, this one is not happening the way you want him to be. That is the problem, isn't it? If this one happened hundred percent the way you want him, life around you, whichever way it happens, it's either a breeze or an adventure. Yes, it is either a sim, you know, gentle, I mean the fragrance of the jasmine on a gentle breeze or it's an adventure. There is no unpleasantness. Unpleasantness, unpleasantness is happening from within you never from outside of you. No, you don't know how unpleasant my boss is. No, no, he only causes at the most if he is. He is causing unpleasantness around you. He cannot cause unpleasantness within you, isn't it? This is your work. This is completely your work, isn't it? Why would anybody cause unpleasantness to himself? Simply because we have chosen to live unconsciously just as a compulsive reaction to everything that's happening around us. For solutions, we are looking into books, we are looking into all kinds of things. We are always looking elsewhere, never inward. This happened, you know, we are from Tennessee. In Tennessee, every family with some kind of tradition has their own leather-bound, large-sized, Bible of their own, they're very proud of this. It's so large, you can barely open it, at least children cannot. One day a school, a boy, twelve years of age, who was studying in a boarding school elsewhere, came home and he found this huge book sitting there and he opened it. A few pages he opened, a leaf which had been there in the book for a long time, it was dry, it flew out and fell down. Then he called out loudly, Mama, come and see what I found. She said, what is it that you have found? Mama, come and see, please come and see what you have, what I have found. She said, come, tell me, what have you found? He said, I think I found Adam's underwear. What is written there and how you perceive it is you, even now. <laughs> even now, how you experience every situation is you. What is happening around you and how you experience it is essentially you. What is written there and what you make out of it is essentially you. Just see, in the name of caste, creed, religion, race, nationalities, how much of a mess we have created on the planet. I'm sure every one of these things initially started with the greatest intention of human well-being, definitely. But just see what a mess we are. Simply because you can find an Ad Adam's underwear in a book, you don't know what you will pick up. So there is a way where there is no room for misinterpretation. That way is to turn inward, not to seek solutions outward. For outward things, you can seek outward solutions. For inner things, you seek inner, in, inner solutions. Turning inward, what does it mean? Right now, as I earlier mentioned, 
The only way you can perceive is through five sense organs – seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. All these things are essentially outward bound. See, you can see what's around you. You cannot roll your eyeballs inward and scan yourself. You can hear this, but so much activity in this body, you cannot hear that. If an ant crawls upon this hand, you can feel it. So much blood flowing, you cannot feel it. In the very nature of things, sense organs are outward bound, but everything that you experience is happening from within. This is the fundamental human predicament. Only if you turn inward, then you are into what you are referring to as India studies. Otherwise, India is a glorious chaos. Lot of Indians miss it. Too much order in America, once in a way they have to go out and get lost and have a diary at least. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> if not enlightenment, at least a diary. You must eat the street food and something must happen. <laughs> no, no, it need not be like that. It is just that it's very organic. It is always depending upon touching the inner genius within every human being. It is not depending upon the organization of the outside, which can be very chaotic. For a person who has been born and brought up in Western societies, India could be bewildering and scary. But you will see, uh, <laughs> Indian people are so much at home with the chaos because it's so organic. Everything is happening because of the human being. If one human being stops being human for a moment, everything collapses. So you can't afford to be mechanical about your life. You have to be conscious, otherwise you cannot manage even simple things in home. Initially this was created consciously. Over a period of time, other things have happened unfortunately <laughs> Now. This whole process of looking inward, what does it mean? Can I… can I tell you my own story? It's okay with you? You're becoming very serious, it scares me <laughs> Shankar and Pillai came to United States. He had an international driving license. So he decided to take his car his son-in-law's car, out for a spin. He's a good driver. If you have driven in India, you better be a good driver, <laughs> otherwise you're a dead driver <laughs> So very confidently he was driving. Then his wife called up on the phone and said, are you on I-75? He said, yeah, just watch out. The traffic news is saying there is a man driving at full speed in the opposite direction. <laughs> he said, what the hell, one man, hundreds of people are driving in the opposite direction <laughs> But he's very comfortable. So what is turning inward mean? This happened to me when I was just three, four years of age. Suddenly one day I realized I don't know anything. I don't know anything means I don't know anything at all. If they give me a glass of water, I do not know what is water. It, when I say I do not know what is water, I know how to use it. I know if I drink it, it'll quench my thirst and so many other ways of using it. But I do not know what is water. Do you know what is water even today? With all this scientific exploration, you must understand we have not understood a single atom in its entirety. We know how to use them, but we do not know what it is even today. 
It is the only thing available in all the three states on the planet. Two-thirds of the world, the planet itself is water, two-thirds of your body is water. If you want to look for life, you look for water. A drop of water means you think life is possible. It's the very basis of your existence on this planet. But you do not know what it is. So they give me a glass of water, I keep staring at this for three, four hours at a stretch. If I find a leaf, I will stare at it five, six hours. I sit up in my bed, staring at the darkness for the whole night. My dear father, being a physician, started thinking I need psychiatric evaluation. <laughs> this boy is just staring at something or the other, unblinking for hours on end, he's lost it. My problem is, I look at this, I do not know what is this, how to shift my attention to something else, I'm just stuck to it, paying attention to it. In this condition, they sent me to school. I went to school and my mother told me, you must pay attention to the teacher. I went and paid attention. <laughs> the kind of attention they would have never received in their life. <laughs> Initially, I understood the words that they were speaking. After some time, I realized they're only making sounds. I am the one who is making up the meanings in my head. Even now, See, I'm only making sounds. Because you presume you know English language, you're making up the meanings. A language is a conspiracy between two people. Yes? Suppose I start talking in a language that you do not understand. It will be just sounds. Even now I'm only making sounds. You're making up the meanings. And there is a code book for this conspiracy called a dictionary. So I realized I'm making up all the meanings in my head and I stopped making up the meanings. Just the sounds, these teachers come and keep on making sounds. The problem with most people is, the moment they cannot understand, they will not pay any attention. Please pay, at especially things that you do not understand, you must pay attention, isn't it? Yes or no? What you do not understand definitely needs your attention. But generally the thing is, the moment you cannot understand, you don't pay attention. Turn on the Chinese channel, just listen carefully <laughs> with full attention. You will see things will happen to you. <laughs> so I just paid attention, not attaching any meanings to the sounds they were making. After some time it became so amusing, these people going on making noises. A big smile spread on my face. They were not amused at all. I was very consistent with my education. Every monthly test, consistently I got six zeros. Uh, because I gave it empty. Because I was made like this, I come home in the evening, evening study hours or two hours in the evening, you must study in the house. If I open the book, I stay like this, without reading a single word, for the next two hours, I will be just like this. All I need is just a dot on the paper, just a tiny speck on the paper. If I put my attention to it, the damn speck will take me somewhere. I won't read a single word, nor will I look around, nor will I do anything, simply. After two hours, I'll be in the same speck, unmoving from that. So my attention is like this, I'm paying attention to the teachers. So, uh, you know, I clearly remember this. When they, every month they give this report card, I don't know if you still have it. You still have that method of report cards? When the report card comes, uh, some children will be strutting around, they are first, second, whatever. Some will be crying, they're terrified to go home because they got something. In my whole school days, all those twelve years, I never opened my report card. The teachers gave it to me, I took it and gave it to my dad. I thought this is a transaction between the two of them. <laughs> I never wanted to, you know, peep into that. And uh, 
I never was retained in any class, I always went on. About four years ago, this school where I studied over four decades ago, they came to invite me for their 125th anniversary of the school. They were inviting all the prominent alumni. They came to invite me. I said, see, please, why me? I was not just a not good student, I was not even a student. <laughs> don't… don't take me to back to the school. They said, no, no, our school has produced federal ministers, our school has produced film stars, our school has produced cricketing stars. You are the only mystic, you have to come. I said, okay <laughs> and I went, I stood up to speak in this quadrangle, the same oppressive buildings. I just looked like this, I suddenly saw this classroom and this whole situation came back to me. I was about twelve years of age. As usual, I am paying absolute attention to the teachers. I know the teachers past, present and future, but I don't hear a word of what they're talking. <clears throat> So that particular afternoon, this teacher is trying to get some response from me. But I am… these are times when for three, four, five days, I wouldn't utter a single word. Because when you don't know anything, what do you say? What is there to say? You know nothing. If you look at a leaf, you don't understand that in entirety. If you look at anything, you don't understand in its fullness. So there's nothing to say. He tried thirty-five, forty minutes trying to get some response. Nothing came out of me, I was paying full attention to him. He came, held me by the shoulder, shook me violently and said, you must either be the divine or the devil, I think you are the later. <laughs> till now, till that moment my problem was, what is this, what is that, what is that, what is that? But there was one clarity that this is me. Suddenly this man confused me about this also. <laughs> I looked, wow, am I devil, am I divine, what the hell am I? <laughs> this was very clear that this was me but this man brought this confusion about this also. I tried to stare at myself, it didn't work, so I closed my eyes and sat. Initially hours, then it went into days. Once I closed my eyes and sat, I thought in my experience I felt it's about twenty-five, thirty minutes. When I opened my eyes, a whole crowd of people around me, garlands around my neck, people are trying to pull my feet, you know, pulling legs is a part of Indian tradition. <laughs> and somebody wants to know about his business, somebody wants to know when his daughters will get married, I said, how the hell did these people manifest here? Where did they come from? Big crowd. They said, you have been sitting here for thirteen days. In my experience, I just sat there for twenty-five, thirty minutes. I closed my eyes and I opened my eyes, a big crowd. Why I am telling you this is, life is in many more ways than the way you understand and experience life through the five senses. The five sense organs are enough for your survival. If you want to just survive, these five things are fine. But if you want to know life, these five sense organs are not good enough because this gives you only a comparative perspective of everything. What you know by comparison? See, you know light only because you know darkness, isn't it? The nature of sense organs is such if you see this part of my hand, you cannot see the other part of my hand. Even if you take a grain of sand, if you see one part, you can't see the other part. If you're experiencing light, you cannot experience the darkness. This is the nature of sense organs and everything is in comparison. For example, let's say you're six feet tall. Now, you stand like a tall man. You walk like a tall man, you think like a tall man, you feel like a tall man and you are a tall man. Suppose you went to another, you went to another society where everybody is eight feet tall. Now, 
you stand like a short man, walk like a short man, think like a short man, feel like a short man and you are a short man. So what you know in comparison is only useful for survival in a particular situation. It is not a way of knowing life. There are other dimensions of perception which a human being has to activate. You need to understand what is needed for survival. Became active. The moment you came out of your mother's womb, all these things became active. You need to understand. They were not active when you were in your mother's womb. Otherwise you would know the whole human physiology. You didn't have to go to your medical school, you know. <laughs> your eyes were not open, your perception was not open. Only after you came out, it opened up because without it you cannot survive. If survival is all you're seeking, this is fine. But once you come as human, somehow survival is not good enough, isn't it? When survival is in question, it's a big issue. Once it's taken care of, it doesn't mean anything. Isn't it so? There is something within you, always longing for something more. Whoever you may be right now, whatever you may be right now, you want to be something more than who you are right now? Yes or no? If that something more happens, what? What? You want something more? If that something more happens, what? Something more. It looks like you're looking for expansion. Okay, we will make you the king or queen of this planet. Now, don't look at me hopefully. <laughs> you think I'll make such a blunder? <laughs> Suppose you become the king or queen of this planet, Will you be fulfilled, I'm asking you? You will look at the stars, isn't it? So there is something within you which wants to expand. I'm asking how much expansion would settle you for good? How much expansion would settle you for good? Hello? Unlimited. You're looking for infinite expansion, a fantastic desire but a hopeless method. Your longing to become boundless is wonderful. See, there is something within you which does not like boundaries. Suppose I imprison you in a five by five cubicle right now, you will feel horribly imprisoned. Tomorrow, we will liberate you into a ten by ten cubicle. You will feel wonderful for a day and again the same thing. Then we will liberate you into a hundred by hundred cubicle. You will feel wonderful for three days and again the same thing. It doesn't matter where I set the boundary. The moment you can feel the boundary, you want to break it. Yes? There is something within you which does not like boundaries. There is something within you constantly longing to become boundless. You may be trying to settle this either unconsciously or consciously. If you are trying to settle it unconsciously, you think uh, going out shopping will settle it. It does for, for a moment, again tomorrow the same thing. Or reading a book will settle it, or conquering a, con uh, something will settle it. All these things settles you for some time and again the same thing. The moment you can feel the boundary, again it's a problem, isn't it? There is something within you longing to become boundless. You need to understand this. Boundaries are essentially the nature of the physical. The physical exists in this universe, the physical exists in creation, only because of defined boundaries. I can call this a physical body only because there is a defined boundary. If I take away the boundaries of this body, could you call this physical? If it is all over the place, would it be physical? Only because it stays within, within a defined boundary, it's physical. So boundary is the nature of physical existence. There is something within you longing to go beyond all boundaries. So if you touch a dimension within you which is not physical in nature, only then this will settle. Is there such a thing? Well, let's understand this. When you were born, your body was only this much. Now it's become this much. How did it happen? How did it happen? The food that you've eaten, isn't it? The food that you've eaten, so what you call as my body is a heap of food actually or it's a piece of this planet. 
Physical is something that you gathered over a period of time, yes? Physical is an accumulation. What you accumulate, at the most you can claim it is mine. It cannot be you, isn't it? It can be yours, it can never ever be you. It can be mine, it can never ever be me, isn't it? What you gather can belong to you, cannot become you. But right now, you are so identified with things that you have gathered, not only in the body, in the mind, your mind is a heap of impressions that you have gathered. Your mind is a gathering, your body is a gathering. Both are accumulations. Between these two things, where are you? A dimension beyond the physical, which is the basis of all this. If you eat a piece of bread, it transforms it into such a fantastic machine that we call as human mechanism. This human body is the most sophisticated technology on the planet. Do you agree with me? Yes. The iPhone users I am asking you. <laughs> because I see you so deeply engrossed in it, you seem to think it's more than the eye. Now, this is the highest level of technology found on the planet. Everything else is a small imitation of this, isn't it? And with what are you manufacturing this? With a piece of bread, with a carrot, with an apple, with whatever you eat. Just about anything that you eat, even if you eat the so-called junk food, even that is becoming wonderful technology. So there is an intelligence here, there is a competence here which is capable of transforming a piece of bread into such a highly sophisticated machine. If only if you had access to this intelligence consciously, you would live your life magically, not miserably for sure. So how often do you touch this? Every human being touches it at some moment in his life. If you can consciously touch it, definitely you would stay in touch with it, isn't it? If you accidentally touch it, then it happens accidentally. Most beautiful moments in people's lives, unfortunately, are generally accidental. People come and tell me, Sadhguru, I met such a wonderful person. I say, stop. Why are you not that wonderful person? Why is it that you're meeting such wonderful people? If you are feeling absolutely wonderful, anything that you look at, looks wonderful, isn't it? Yes or no? Have you noticed this? When you are happy, you appreciate everything. When you are miserable, everything is… the whole creation is a rubbish. Yes or no? So this possibility is not in the Himalayan cave. This possibility is not geographically located in India. This possibility is here with every one of us. Whether we turn inward, or we squander our, squander our life outward, that's all the choice you have. Because the experience of life, the quality of your life is right now determined not by what kind of clothes you wear, what kind of car you parked outside, what kind of home you live in. This moment, what is the nature of your experience? Is it immensely pleasant or unpleasant or seesawing between the two? That determines the quality of your life.